Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. My name is Zach. I am your host. And uh, tonight we're going to be covering the audiobook version of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin, Chapter 12, Part 2. And my guest tonight is going to be Sean Scholes of the Tribunus Plebis podcast. Uh, he'll be calling in, in in just a moment here, and we're going to uh, get into the audio and, and uh, try and relate it to the modern day and maybe things that have happened in the news and stuff like that. So uh, just give me one second here, and I'll, I'll uh, set up that call right now. How are you there, Sean? Hey, how we doing? Good, how are you? Hello, good. I'm doing awesome. All right. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's been a, a couple of weeks since last we, we tried this, uh, this, uh, um, stream. I, I've, you know, just had, uh, some, uh, realities of capitalism, <laughs> shall we say, get in the way. I've, I've had to work the, the past couple of Fridays, uh, but, but, uh, graciously Sean has, has managed to carve out some time in his schedule, uh, to do it on Sunday. So I thank you very much for your flexibility. Hey, no problem, man. I'm I'm glad to be here. All right. How have you been in the past couple of weeks? Any anything new with you? Uh, you know what? I've been pretty good. Um, I can't say there's anything new, but you know, working, living life. We just got back from taking my mother out for a birthday dinner, so everything's oh, good. Nice. Yeah, my mom's birthday was just uh, uh this last weekend too. So. Oh, nice. Cool. All right. Uh, is it is it blazing hot out where you are as well? It is. It was like 98 degrees today. Yeah, that's that's about what it was here too. So let, let me set that up right now, and we will get into part three. Well, actually, this is part two of, of our discussion, but it's part three of the chapter itself, in uh, chapter 12 of Peter Kropotkin's *The Conquest of Bread*, one of the seminal works of uh, the anarcho-communist philosophy. Uh, it's it's. I think it's about 130 years or so old right now, but it still has a lot of relevant points. So I hope you all enjoy it. And we will start with the audio now, uh, pausing whenever we have something to, to chat about. So here we go. Part three. Those who have seriously uh, studied the question do not deny any of the advantages of communism. On condition, be it well understood, that communism is perfectly free. That is to say, anarchist. They recognize that work paid with money, even disguised under the name of labor notes, to workers' associations governed by the state, would keep up the characteristics of wagedom and would retain its disadvantages. They agreed that the whole system would soon suffer from it, even if society came into possession of the instruments of production. And they admit that, thanks to integral education given to all children, to the laborious habits of civilized societies, with the liberty of choosing and varying their occupations and the attractions of work done by equals for the well-being of all, a communist society would not be wanting in producers who would soon make the fertility of the soil triple and tenfold and give a new impulse to industry. This our opponents agree to. They say, quote, Can we, but the, can we stop there? Go ahead. So, um, you know, when I'm listening to that opening part, I'm, it sounds like he's really just talking about what we call wage slavery, I guess. Sure. Right. Which is, I, I think where we started this chapter last week, that wage labor and having our excess value stolen from us doesn't really, you know, turn us into more productive workers than otherwise. Right. And that, you know, the wage system is really just coercion because we need at least some cash to pay for rent or mortgage and food and all that stuff. Right. Right. And, you know, so long as wage labor exists and really money exists, probably the world will, I guess, uh, I don't know, I guess it'll suffer from those disadvantages, even if, right. like he laid out here, workers somehow came into possession of the means of production. It would, you know, if it was still wage uh, labor, you'd still have the same issues. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you still would have the same issues. Um, kind of the way that I look at it with the, the current capitalist system is that uh, the owner basically views people as living machines, that they are going to spend as little as possible on maintaining them. Like you wouldn't spend, you know, money you didn't have to to repair, uh, you know, your car or, um, you know, uh, 
any sort of manufacturing equipment or anything like that. You wouldn't want to spend extra money on maintaining that. And so, and so the way that the uh, owner of a given uh, means of production looks at their employees is just living machines. So they're not going to pay more than they absolutely have to to maintain the ability of those workers to keep on working. So, you know, that, that, that tends to drive down wages. Um, and, you know, people are just as seen as, as moving parts, really. So Right, and, and not like free. Not, which not, is yeah. the whole basis of this chapter, you know, that the truly free people will be more productive and industrious than, right. you know, those that struggle under the yoke of starvation and privation and fear. You know, it doesn't seem too difficult to suss that out when you stop and think about it. Yet Absolutely. here we are. Yeah. And and, and um, kind of the, the opposite side of, of that coin that I was talking about with the, the workers being viewed as uh, living machinery is that. Workers are not dumb. They're not going to be likely to put in more effort than they are getting in return because really what does it, I mean, it literally doesn't profit them, but what do they gain from it other than possibly looking good for the boss and, and not getting uh, fired? So, so yeah, if everyone's making more money because you're, you're sharing things more democratically, then it would, it would stand to reason that things are going to be more productive and, and people are going to do more for whatever company they they find themselves a part of right and uh do you remember what that term was that they use the code word oh you remember oh, it was, from... uh, uh, <laughs> something, something to do with like can or canning or cannery or something like that can... uh, I'll, I'll yeah to, something canny i'll have to look Damn. back at that. all right <laughs> that, that was funny though. Just re- had the, the canny for the the, the slowdown of, of work yeah, oh, I wish I could remember what that was. God, something canny. canny. I think you're right, but that's okay. Yeah. We we can we can yeah. move on. Yeah, okay, okay, let's move on. Uh, or yeah, sure. The danger will come from that minority of loafers who will not work and will not have regular habits in spite of excellent conditions that make work pleasant. Today, the prospect of hunger compels the most refractory to move along with the others. The one who does not arrive in time is dismissed but a black sheep suffices to contaminate the whole flock and two or three sluggish or refractory workmen lead the others astray and bring a spirit of disorder and rebellion into the workshop that makes work impossible. So that in the end, we shall have to return to a system of compulsion that forces the ringleaders back into the ranks. And is not the system of wages paid in proportion of work performed, the only one that enables compulsion to be employed without hurting the feelings of the worker? because all other means would imply the continual intervention of an authority that would be repugnant to free men, unquote. This, we believe, is the objection fairly stated. It belongs to the category of art. Go ahead. Because, so I think that this is kind of interesting because it feels like he's sort of, I mean, he's basically steel manning, right? He's Mm -hmm. laying out the opponent's argument. Right. And it's, it's just a lot of nonsense right. and it's really annoying because, you know, like I say, I realize that Kropotkin isn't arguing that this is true and that he's just kind of presenting, you mm. know, the argument against what he wants. Right. But, you know, this is the same nonsense that the liberals and right wingers are throwing out there right now about people not wanting to return to work. Oh, I'm getting right? so sick of hearing those arguments. <laughs> yeah. And they're basically saying that they're all lazy and malcontents and malingerers or right. whatever. And damn it, it's time to get back to work and get off the government's tit. Damn it, you right. know. And it's just nonsense. And of this is actually what my, yeah. Uh, sorry. Go, go ahead. <laughs> uh, this is what my newest episode is about. Oh, wonderful. You know, you know that these kind of sociopaths are trying to literally starve people back into the workforce. Yes. And they're doing that rather than compensating them in a fair manner. Right. Right. To make already poor people so desperate that they'll that they'll be willing to remain poor, but also work. And, you know, I mean, that going back to a bad job won't really be a net benefit for poor people. They'll just be trading or, you know, they'll just be trading time at home for time at work and still being poor. Yeah. Hard hard to figure out why they don't want to make that choice. Yeah, and then they refuse to even <laughs> acknowledge that there are any other underlying issues preventing people from returning to work, right? 
like right. uh, child care, COVID, low wages, and so on. And it just really bothers me. Yeah. And, but I, I guess I'll, I'll let Kropotkin take it from here or, sure. you know, talk with you a little bit more. Sure. But it just, it's aggravating. Yeah. So, so one of my thoughts that, that came up with that is this idea that if, if people, if the masses, if left to their own devices, would just be lazy and, and just, you know, be on the government dole or, you know, take without giving and all, all these, all these, these, really terrible arguments that are being thrown at them how do we ever get to the point of civilization was it just through the whip like some really industrious guy decided to force everyone to to work better for their own survival like it doesn't there's 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 a big chunk missing there in my mind of how we came from from being basically tribal societies to more industrialized ones uh yeah i I think that somebody might have invented the whip yeah. and then invented capitalism so yeah. that he could use his whips and sell them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I guess it's amazing that people survived as long as they did without having someone <laughs> telling them what to do. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> amazing. All right. Well, let, let's continue on a little bit more here. Arguments okay. which justify <laughs> the state, the penal law, the judge and the gallower. The authoritarians say, quote, as there are people, a feeble minority who will not submit to social customs, we must maintain magistrates, tribunals, and prisons, although these institutions become a source of new evils of all kinds, unquote. Therefore, we can only repeat what we have so often said concerning authority in general, quote, to avoid a possible evil, you have to recourse to means in which themselves are a greater evil and become the source of those same abuses that you wish to remedy. For do not forget that it is wage dumb, the impossibility of living otherwise than selling your labor, which has created the present capitalist system, whose vices you began to recognize." Unquote. Let us also remark that this authoritarian way of reasoning is but a... I just want to pause one, one second there. Um, mm -hmm. So how I interpret that, that, that last little passage there was the, the, uh, the, the advice, if you want to even call it that, that capitalists, especially small business owners, like to, to throw at the working poor, saying that, well, you don't want to be a laborer anymore. You don't want to have all your profit go to someone else. Well, just become a boss. You know, it's just, it's just trading uh, your servitude for basically other people's servitude because, it, like as you said, there's, there's no possibility of, of everyone doing well. So, so either you are the exploiter or the exploited. And that doesn't seem like a good bargain to me. I don't, I don't really aspire to <laughs> exploit other people as much as I don't want myself to be exploited in my labor. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that, Sean? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I guess last ep or yeah, last episode we mm -hmm. talked about um, telling slaves that if they don't want to be the slave, they should yes. become a master, I recall, you yeah. know, in, in that whole talking point. And it feels like Kropotkin is saying that if the primary resource that we have as people to escape oppression is to become oppressors, then we are, you know, at the very least complicit and just continuing the general suffering of people. Absolutely. And that's the minimum. We may actually be making it worse. Right. Right. Yeah. We may be creating and supporting like an even greater evil than whatever it was that we are trying to escape. Sure. And, and I mean, what, what, a, what a sad future or, or what a sad uh, bargain capitalism is then offering people if that's the best that it can do. If, if, if the best that it can do is, well, you, you may have a chance to, to be the one in control at the expense of everybody else. That's, I mean, there goes the, the, these, uh, you know, supposedly, or, or in my mind, incompatible ideas of things like the American dream, where everyone can make it if they work really hard. I mean, that, that becomes an impossibility because you have to have a certain number of exploited people for you to be an exploiter. It, 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 the math just doesn't work out. Um, right. The idea that education can, is, is the, the gateway to the middle class. That can't be true for everyone if some people have to be exploited for the whole system to work. 
I mean, these these myths that that keep people going and keep people driving, they just they they start to fall apart when you realize that it, by its very structure, capitalism cannot be an egalitarian system, or or even really a, much of a meritocracy, um, because some people just have to be left behind in order for it to keep functioning. Right. Yeah. I mean, just as a fact like a very simple fact, uh -huh. not everybody can be a business owner. You need yeah. workers to do this. You do. You do. So, I mean, it, I mean, it becomes like uh, the, the, the problem of the pyramid schemes, of, of especially like the 1970s, where people would, would get together. And uh, I remember hearing a, a podcast about this game called the airplane game, where you, you'd throw a party, and everyone who came in the door would donate $100 or something like that. Um, and the people that were throwing the party got to be, they, they were called the pilots, and they selected a co-pilot. And then there was, like, the crew, and they got uh, um, a certain percentage of that chunk. But most of the money goes to, to the pilot. And then the, the next most goes to the crew. And then I guess everyone who's, who's in the airplane, you know, the metaphorical airplane, um, they're just donating their money, but they're, they're doing it in order to have the chance to later on become a pilot of their own and throw a party where people give them a bunch of money. So the idea being uh. that, you know, if you do enough of these parties, you get to be in control <laughs> and you end up making more money for doing nothing than, than you would, than you, than you've given out, than you've shelled out by, 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 um, being a passenger again and again and again. And that works really well as long as you always have more people coming in the door. As, right. as, as soon as, you know, they, they looked at the math of it and, you know, it wouldn't be that many years before everyone in the entire world would be, have to be involved in the game in order to keep it going. So huh. yeah, that's pretty wild. Yeah. I, I've seen some version of that on Facebook of people trying to get like books and uh, software and money. And it was, it seemed like it was run very close to that, but I'd never heard of an airplane game before. Oh yeah. Well, I, I think eventually they had to outlaw it. I, I remember, uh, I think the person that they were interviewing talking about how the, the FBI just showed up to one of their parties and just started arresting people and stuff like that because yeah, they saw the writing on the wall and they, they didn't want people to get screwed over. And you know, once that game ended, a whole hell of a lot of people did get screwed over because they never got to be their, their pilot. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> so it, it, it's it's not exactly the same with capitalism, but on the other hand, capitalism keeps on needing to expand, it seems, in order for for it to keep going. You know, you have to have new people in new lands to exploit, to get the cheap labor from. And then once they start to get around to unionizing and demanding better conditions and stuff like that, you have to find a new market. You have to find new sources of, of raw materials constantly to, to, to keep things churning and, and moving along. Uh, so I think there's definitely a lot of parallels to these sorts of, I guess they're really Ponzi schemes when it comes down to it. You know, you just have more and more people yeah. coming in the door to donate and, and you can keep things going. But as soon as that yep. stops, the wheels fall off and it, it falls apart. So Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's keep on moving in the chapter. Justification mm -hmm. of what is wrong in the present system. Wagedom was not instituted to remove the disadvantage of communism. Its origin, like that of the state and private ownership, is to be found elsewhere. It is born of slavery and serfdom imposed by force, and only wears a more modern garb. Thus, the argument in favor of wagedom is as valueless as those by which they seek to apologize for private property and the state. We are nevertheless going to examine the objection and see if there is any truth in it. To begin with, it is not evident that if a society founded on the principle of free work were really menaced by loafers, it could protect itself without an authoritarian organization and without having recourse to wage them. Let us take a group of volunteers combining for some particular enterprise. Having its success at heart, they all work with a will, save for one of the associates who is frequently absent from his post. Must they, on his account, dissolve the group, elect a president to impose fines, or maybe distribute markers for work done, as is customary in the academy? It is evident that neither the one nor the other will be done, but that someday the comrade who imperils their enterprise will be told, quote, 
Friend, we should like to work with you, but as you are often absent from your post and you do your work negligently, we must part. Go and find other comrades who will put up with your indifference. Unquote. This way is so natural can we, that... It, can we go, pause there? Go ahead. So this just sort of sounds like social shunning, right? Right. Like, like, hey, man, if you're not willing to help us build this water tower, <laughs> then go find another project, maybe. Yeah. You know, maybe your heart just isn't in carpentry or metal work. Mm -hmm. Right. And even people could even help them find a better spot, too. Maybe, you know, you find out that that person just really loves music or something. So you get them teaching music sure. or playing for other workers to entertain them a little bit. Right. Right. And the other thing that I'm thinking about here, and I'm not sure if Kropotkin mentions this in this chapter. Uh, I don't remember right now. And he might in 30 seconds. So, sure, no but problem. anarchist stuff that I've read. And I'm honestly not a huge theory nerd in general, so I could be wrong. That's cool. But even the loafers, uh -huh. as or as you know, we kind of call them sometimes, mm -hmm. they would even get some level of food and comfort. Right. You know, that, that seems to be the general consensus from what I've seen, at least. And again, I'm not, you know, an anarchy expert. So anarchists, please don't crush me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think but that's I pretty accurate. That yeah, and I just wanted to bring that up because I've seen a lot of right-wing types suggest that what Kropotkin or people like him are saying, that it's tantamount to basically starving someone into work. But yeah. I don't think anarchists tend to be that cruel. Oh, I don't and certainly so, yeah. not that cruel in like the Ayn Randian yes. right-wing libertarian sense, for sure, where oh. they just suggest that if someone doesn't work for a wage, they should just kind of die. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I, yeah. That, that, that book's all coming back to me right now. The Atlas shrug there, <laughs> the, the pledge that everyone has to make to, to never buy. And they, they dress it up with fancy words, but it's something like never by the sweat of my brow. Shall I live for another's comfort or survival or whatever? It's something like some, yep. some crap like that. Yeah. Just, just utter cruelness. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, I would, I would definitely agree with that. Um, and if, if you factor in uh, the, these sorts of anarchist tendencies, such as like mutual aid, well, mutual aid, unlike charity, is is giving to people based on whatever needs they say and without any 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 thought of reciprocity or, or personal gain or anything like that, just because you have something extra and someone says they need it and, and that's it. So. I, I couldn't imagine a, a anarchist society that would threaten people under under penalty of of starvation or, you know, um, or, or or kicking them out of the society or anything like that. That 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 doesn't seem to register, or that that wouldn't seem to line up with with my conception of what an anar uh, an anarchist uh, society would look like, at all. Um, so yeah, I, I would definitely agree with you. I, I think, I mean, if you look at it right now, how many rich CEOs, how many, uh, you know, hedge fund managers, how many business owners of, of, of every stripe do little to no work every year, how many landlords, let's, let's throw them in the mix too, do little mm. to no work every year and are still given a, a, a you know, cherished or, or, or revered position in society. Uh, no one calls them loafers, or, I mean, very few people do. Certainly the mainstream idea is Anarchist not that they too. are loafers. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I would, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but, but, yeah, and somehow society keeps uh, humming along, even though they're just leeching off everybody else. So could it really be any worse if a few people at the very bottom did the same thing? I don't really think so. Um, and, and we produce such an abundance right now and we could continue to without, uh, w I mean, without making people work even more than they are now, we can continue on in a system that, that, that Kropotkin is describing, um, and, and still produce a, a, a huge overabundance and without the profit motive to, to hold us back, we wouldn't be doing things like, uh, pouring milk down the drain because the price was too low or you know right. burying a, a crop because the you know you couldn't get the the logistics in time um we would just be 
doing our best to distribute it where it was needed. Um, so I can't imagine society falling apart because the very, very, very tiny minority of people who literally would take advantage would take advantage. It, it just doesn't doesn't add up to me. So I would agree. With yeah. That. And, you know, th- those uh, videos of the tankers, the milk tankers lined up and just pouring milk into a ditch. Oh, they break your heart. That was de- yeah, super depressing. Absolutely. And I saw this uh, in grocery stores w- that I would deliver to. Oh, yeah. And I watched people, they were throwing out produce. Mm. And they were giving some bread to a um, food kitchen. Sure. Which was nice. But yeah, the nice. guy from the food kitchen said, hey, can we get some of that produce? And he said, no, I can't do that because it's... Ex- it's been I, I don't know if expired is the right word but it's hit it's been in the store a certain amount of days it's, it's hit its freshness so he said, or whatever yeah at, at, yeah at that point we consider it spoiled and we have to throw it all out yeah right and I was just watching literally three shopping carts full of perfect looking carrots and broccoli and lettuce just all being thrown into a dumpster and it was really sad to see especially when there was somebody right there two feet away from it Saying, I can give that to poor people and homeless people. Right. And they still threw it out. Right. Uh, yeah. And imagine how many more people could could benefit from that sort of thing if, if we just changed that entire mindset where this, you know, instead of saying, well, this is not something that I can make a, a profit with with my business, so I'm going to destroy it. We took it to where it was needed. You know, we, we, yeah. we created that infrastructure you know, if it's something that, that spoils quickly, if we had refrigerated trucks, you know, ready and waited, waiting to go to distribute it out to uh, another place where people could pick it up. Um, you know, we could do these sorts of things that, that wouldn't be all that hard and it wouldn't cost all that much money. Uh, and in fact, it would, it would save people so much money that they would have more money to put into the system. If, if we're going right. to maintain a monetary system at all. But, but yeah. That's right. Of, and you know what? Go ahead. At, at the, at the uh, register end of that store, right. I would almost guarantee that they were asking people to donate things. Oh, for sure. For and sure. meanwhile, out the back door, they're throwing perfectly good food into dumpsters. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um. But it could. We we could we could rational. We could make that system a more rational, and caring, um, and uh, mutual aid fulfilling sort of a system. Um, and I don't I don't know that too much about, you know, safe food handling laws. But that, that you know, if if this sort of thing strikes a chord with any of you listeners out there, um, there's there's definitely organizations that that try to do something about this sort of thing. Um, and if, if those organizations don't exist where you are, that, that may be something that you could look into to starting uh, to, to be, be able to at, at least accept these, these sorts of foods before they're thrown out, um, to work with, with local businesses. You know, sometimes maybe all it takes is you know, an official capacity of, of saying, you know, I work for such and such nonprofit, and you know, I'd like to work with your business to, to help recapture some stuff that, that is going to waste. There's a, there's a pretty good success story in uh, Minneapolis where there's a group called Sisters Camelot and they work with all the local food co-ops to take those those very foods that that are I, I don't know I don't even know if they're legally not being able to or not able to be sold or if it's if it's just a, a profit sort of thing if once it gets you know X number of days towards the the freshness date or the sell by date that that the company decides or the co-op decides to to not keep it out on the shelves whatever it is they take all that food all that they can save and they distribute it out to people for free um they they, they take it all into a bus and they did travel around from site to site and you know all their their volunteer organization and uh the people that volunteer they they get first um first choice of all the food and and then they they spend a, a few hours distributing the rest so these, these sorts of systems are possible, even under the current system, and, and we can start building these, these, these really vital blocks to, that, that, you know, if done right, could change people's lives and, and help lift them up to a point where they're, they're not under the thumb of, of wage slavery, you know? And, and 
bringing it back to the, the um, unemployment benefits, that, that's really been shown to be uh, something that people can stand on to demand collectively higher wages. You know, we're, we're starting to see businesses respond to the shortage, the, the, the quote unquote shortage of labor uh, by raising their, their, their wages that they're offering. Uh, because people have that that unemployment to fall back on, so it's the same sort of thing with food. You just you just create a cushion for people to fall back on, so they're not you know feeling like they need to get a job. They need to get a job, and they'll just take whatever. It it, it removes that desperation, that 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 literal threat of starvation, uh, by by just uh, tweaking things a little bit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I just wanted to. Uh use something to point out that people's voices can matter when they're in a group. Absolutely. And I was, I don't know if you remember the grocery store, I think it was in Seattle that threw out like a bunch of food in a dumpster and people mm -hmm. started going to the dumpster to take the, you know, perfectly good canned food and boxed food and the city deployed police to protect the trash. I do recall that. Yes. It, but there were enough people there who made enough noise that the food was then distributed. And I, I, I think that's just an important lesson for, Absolutely. you know, kind of everyday praxis out there, you know? Yeah. I, that, that, that sure is a bittersweet story though, because yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, I mean, it seems criminal to me that that would be the, the city's first response is can't have people getting food for free out of a dumpster. Let's, let's stop them with, potentially lethal force yeah or even just um a criminal record oh uh, yeah and, and screw up their chance for a job at you know later in their life all you know all of that stuff is force right. and violence i mean they they could have taken the exact opposite route they could have said hey there's a clear need here how can we serve our citizens who are so clearly struggling and who are who are looking to this as as a good option to you know, meet their needs. How can we set up a system to make sure that this food is safe? Because, I mean, ostensibly, I'm sure that was the, the reasoning that and probably property theft because somehow garbage is still the property of yeah. whoever yeah. throws it out. But, but yep. I, say, in, instead of going that route and saying, hey, we got to protect property, we, we, we uh, have to protect people from potentially spoiled food, why not? Make sh why not come in and say, hey, we, we have an opportunity here where we can distribute perfectly good food and we can make sure we can put the city's seal of approval on it and, and have the backing of the law to, to make sure that people are getting safe, clean, nutritious food that otherwise would be wasted. It just, it boggles my mind why, why the one was the response when it could have been the exact opposite, probably for less money, you know, probably would take a lot yeah. less money to... Yep. To not have to put these these police on on the payroll to to do the specific guarding of dumpsters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, cool. All right, I think we should uh, move on move along a little bit in the chapter. Yeah, see what yeah. We can come. But it is practiced everywhere nowadays in all industries, <laughs> in competition with all possible systems of fines, docking of wages, supervision, etc. A workman may enter the factory at the appointed time, but if he does his work badly. If he hinders his comrades by his laziness or other defects, and they quarrel with him on that account, there is an end of it. He is compelled to leave the workshop. Authoritarians pretend that it is the almighty employer and his overseers who maintain regularity and quality of work in factories. In fact, in a somewhat complicated enterprise, in which the wares produced pass through many hands before being finished, it is the factory itself, the workmen as a unity, who see to the good quality of the work. Therefore, the best factories of British private industry have few overseers, far less on an average than for the French factories and less than the British state factories. A certain standard of public morals is maintained in the same way. Authoritarians say it is due to rural guards, judges, and policemen, whereas in reality it is maintained in spite of judges, policemen, and rural guards. Many are the laws producing criminals has been said long ago. Not only in industrial here? workshops sure. do things go on in this way, it happens... Go ahead. All right, so the thing that really hits me about this 
you know, this last bit is just how, like, on one hand, it's antiquated, and mm-hmm. on the other hand, it's it's so modern that it's <laughs> scary. Yeah. You know, he mentions how industry basically, and I'm talking about Kropotkin's time here, sure. like the le- the late 1800s, I guess, yep. how yep. industry, you know, it basically uses the carrot and sticks and shunning through firings and fines and docking wages and whatnot to control its workers. Then mm-hmm. he goes on to say that the best factories have fewer overseers. And that's sort of the antiquated part, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but in modern times, it's even more perverse in many ways. Mm-hmm. Right? Like now, instead of overseers or supervisors, it's an artificial intelligence. Right. You know, that, that's been given eyes and ears and a voice through cameras and handheld devices and yeah. you know they track workers every move which we talked about with amazon warehouses mm-hmm. on the last episode mm-hmm. and my own job has done this too Ugh. they've gamified the yeah they've gamified the job right you know people at my job they the, i'm talking about the forklift operators the guys who work on the dock like sure. maybe 20 guys out there at a time and now they right now on their little handhelds, they have a live feed of how they're doing, right? It tells them where they rank out of like the 20 guys on duty and how far ahead or behind they are. And if they start dropping in the rankings, the computer turns from green to yellow and then red. And all the workers know who's in front and who's, who's lagging behind. And essentially it's like a technology induced self shaming and like a collective shaming. And it's pretty degrading. Yeah. You know, it, it, like it's kind of like become, I don't know what, what a good word, like an electronic panopticon uh-huh. that that word. hurts us all. Ex- except unlike, you know, the, the physical panopticon, the prison, this is like a panopticon that you just can't escape. Yeah. Right, because it's AI. You, right. There's not even a guard to replace. There's no blinking. You can't even become yeah. the guard at this point. Right. Oh, that's you know, that's it's dystopian. Uh, yeah, and and it just it takes away all the agency from every worker to manage their own time, to know how their body feels, what it can handle, to uh, like even respond to needing to go to the bathroom. Um, yeah. As we talked about with Amazon, to understanding how much work needs to be done and and pacing yourself so that you can get it done within the time frame it just takes away all of that stuff and outsources it to yeah this like unblinking panopticon as 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 you put it which i think is a good way to to state it and yeah it's just so dehumanizing i was i was recently reading um brave new world I, i i just read through ah, that, the okay. audiobook. And one of the things that was striking to me was how little surveillance there was in this imagined future world. I believe it was written in the 1920s. Uh, so there was no such thing as a video camera at that time. Uh, there may have been film cameras, but they, they didn't factor into this, this, this state, which, which you know, right. is, is constantly a touchstone for... <laughs> totalitarian to the extreme in the way that they manage people's lives. Um, so yeah, I just, I just thought that was an interesting way that they, they got it wrong, which it's even worse yeah. than, than imagined in brave. New yeah, I, I agree. But you know, I, I haven't read that book in many years, uh-huh. but w- was it mostly like controlled through sort of like social paradigms? Is yeah. that how they kept everybody in check? Yeah, they're, they're two main... In, like, the news. Right. Yep, the news was a big one. Lot, lots of, uh, you know, it was all state-controlled media. But I, I think the, the main two levers of control that they would always throw were um, conditioning through repetition. So they, they would do, they call it sleep training, where they would, they would play right. messages to the children about who they were, what they were, where their social status was, and all this stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And then also drugs were freely available to anyone. So anytime anyone had a negative... Um, reaction to anything, they would take this called soma, and they would take uh, you know a gram or a few grams depending on how bad it was, and they would just 
you know, slip into kind of a bliss coma and, and when they come out of it ready to, to work again or, or do whatever they wanted to do. Um, so, yeah, yeah they so. just renamed Soma Netflix. <laughs> I mean, pretty much or social media in general. <laughs> like you get that little alert yeah. thing. It, it, it is a hit of dopamine. There's, there's a lot of truth it is. to those sorts of analyses. But, but yeah. And and with the, the algorithms that, that then guide your decisions based on what other people have thought uh, was relevant, supposedly. But but, you know, how do you really know? <laughs> I mean, I I'm sure we've all had kind of a uh, wild recommendations like, you know, once in a while I'll watch a, a Ben Shapiro video to to analyze it. And, you know, all of a sudden I'm getting ads for PragerU and stuff like that. So, oh, yeah. Yep. You know, it, it doesn't take that much to, to send someone down a path that they may not have ever chosen, really. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was an interesting book. Um, I was a bit disappointed with uh, Brave New World. It, it ended up, in my opinion, kind of being a fascist fever dream of a world. That it's it's basically when when Ben Shapiro gets up on the the, the video. Um, or up on camera and, and talks about the world that the left wants and stuff like that. That, that, that seems to be basically the world that they described where absolutely no morality and, 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 you know, religion's been abolished and people are, are constantly on drugs. they they have sex all day long and whenever they feel like it. And, and don't tease me. Yeah. yeah no, I mean, some of it. Yeah, sure. Like, <laughs> don't, don't throw me with a good time, but, but, uh, you know, and, 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 other parts were like, you know, uh, their thoughts are all controlled by this conditioning, which is definitely not a great thing. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's control. They, that's, that's always the charge. The left just wants control of everybody. Um, and the, the main characters, basically only choices are to embrace this, you know, gaping maw of complete, you know, totalitarian um, sublimation into the, 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 the greater whole and, and the complete obliteration of their own personality or to go backwards and embrace, um, you know, a completely reactionary track. So there's no other way ever considered in the book. So it ends up kind of, yeah, like I say, it's kind of a fascist commercial mm. in my opinion, but, but there was definitely some good things to pull from it. Some definitely some, you know, interesting um, cautionary tales to, to come out of that, especially like the conditioning man. Stuff is very pervasive. There's a reason that the the advertising industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. It, it wouldn't be if it didn't work. Yeah, absolutely. So, All right. Do you have any other thoughts on this this chapter? Or, or not this chapter, this part of the, the <laughs> chapter be, before we no, move sir. on? No, sir. All right. No, we'll, we can move on. For let's sure. keep going. Everywhere, every day, on a scale that only bookworms have as yet no notion of, when a railway company federated with other companies fails to fulfill its engagements when its trains are late and goods lie neglected at the stations. The other companies threaten to cancel the contract, and that threat usually suffices. It is generally believed, at any rate it is taught, that commerce only keeps to its engagements from fear of lawsuits. Nothing of the sort. Nine times in ten, the trader who has not kept his word will not appear before a judge. There, where trade is very great, as in London, the sole fact of having driven a creditor to bring a lawsuit suffices for the immense majority of merchants to refuse for good to have any dealings with a man who has compelled one of them to go to law. Then, why should means that are used today among mates in the workshop, traders, and railway companies not be made use of in a society based on voluntary work? Take, for example, an associating stipulating that each of its members should carry out the following contract. Quote, we undertake to give you the use of our houses, stores, streets, means of transport, schools, museums, etc., on the condition that, from 20 to 45 or 50 years of age, you consecrate four or five hours a day to some work recognized as necessary to existence. Choose yourself the producing groups which you wish to join, or organize a new group, provided that it will undertake to produce necessaries. And, as for the remainder of your time, Combine together with those you like for recreation, art, or science, according to the bent of your taste. Twelve or fifteen hundred hours of work a year in a group producing food, clothes, or houses, or employed in public health, transport, etc., is all we ask of you. For this work, we guarantee to you all that these groups produce or will produce. But 
So this is a, an important concept that he's setting up here, the idea mm. of kind of voluntary associations with, uh, I guess, guilds, for lack of a better term. Um, just kind of whatever work you feel like doing, uh, as, as long as other people agree to do it along with you, then, you know, basically form a, a worker self-directed enterprise and, and go forth. And, you know, as, as long as we can all collectively make enough for, for our own survival and, and needs, then, you know, the rest of your time is your own. And I, th- I think that's a pretty compelling, um, uh, pitch for, for, for what he's talking about. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think there's a lot of, a lot of truth to it, mm-hmm. especially in small, like a smaller community. If someone is routinely not meeting agreements and stuff, the word generally gets around, right. you know, and any bad actor would be shunned, you know, coming around again, I guess, to the social shunning that he talked about earlier, you know, and fewer and fewer people will want to risk working with that person. Um, sure. Yeah. And, and I agree, you know, you said the rest of the time is yours, but really he's also saying that, all of your work time is really yours because that, you have a, a good choice. Point. Good point. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Voluntary association, not not being coerced through threat of, of punishment or starvation or, you know, even necessarily social ostracism. Ostrac- oh man, I cannot say that word. Uh, <laughs> being a social pariah. Shunning. Well, put it that way. <laughs> I pronounce it shunning. Shunning. Yeah, there you go. Shunning. That's a, that's a nice, <laughs> nice clean word. Um, because, I mean, if these people are in a large enough community, it, it may just not matter. Like, maybe people will just give them stuff, all the stuff they need anyway, and it doesn't really matter if they're, you know, quote-unquote productive because all the work that's necessary still gets done. Right. Um, and, that, you know, that brings up the, the book that I've just started reading uh, in my own time, uh, Bullshit Jobs by... by um, oh. Graber, and, right? Yeah, yeah, Graber. David Graber. Um, absolute legend rest in peace Graber I know it's taken way too young uh, uh, had such such a productive life ahead of him and yep. it's you know it's, it's a tragedy all the, all the stuff that he could have produced but yeah bullshit jobs and the, and the concept is that and I, I was even surprised to, to learn some of the initial findings that they, that they had talked about I'm only like a, a chapter or two in but he's already talking about these people self-reporting in in many, you know, quote unquote, westernized or industrial countries, the US, the UK, and, and, and a few more, that up to 50% or more of jobs, the people that work in them believe that they could not exist and it wouldn't make a difference to the world at all. Right. That's just stunning. That's yeah. just stunning. How much, I mean, if, and if that's true, if, if there is truth to the, the idea that we are overworking our people by 50% or more, um, then yeah, it wouldn't really matter if a few people just don't do anything because, you know, there's, there's a lot of just completely useless work being done right now and we could just do yeah. away with it. We could just say, Hey, to hell with it that, you know, there's, especially if you do away with any sort of profit motive, what's the reason to be a corporate lawyer or what were some of the other ones that he had mentioned? Oh, I'll, I'll think of them. But uh, all, the, all these, these various jobs where people, by and large, tend to, to believe that they are not useful at all, like to a person, you know? Yeah, the thing that uh, really hit me the most with that book was he talked about, like, uh, you might not have gotten here yet, but I'll tell you anyway. No, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> he, he talks about, like, division managers in big corporations that oh. they purposefully overhire. Right. And to make themselves look good because they're like, look, I got 40 people under. Me. Right. Right. But then when the command come that de- comes down from corporate, they, s- that, you know, you need to call jobs for whatever reason, for more profits or whatever, to make the shareholders happy. Mm-hmm. That same guy can then fire half of his staff, uh-huh. have 20 workers and he can go to the boss and say, man, look what I did for you. <laughs> It's such a sick game. <laughs> These so people's that, lives, yeah. though. It's it's ridiculous. yeah, it's yeah, it's people's lives. Oh. You didn't end. You didn't need those jobs to begin with. They could have been doing something that they weren't going to get fired from. Yeah, yeah. I mean, or just staying home. Whatever you know, depending on how how far you want to go. But my God, it was it blew my mind. Well, you know, so much for the efficiency of of the capitalist system. 
you know, yep. if you if you are over employing just to make yourself look good, where's I mean that's the antithesis of efficiency. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> it's incredible. All right. Well, let's continue on a little bit. But if not one of the thousands of group of our federation will receive you, whatever be their motive, if you are absolutely incapable of producing anything useful, or if you refuse to do it, then live like an isolated man or like an invalid. If we are rich enough to give you the necessaries of life, we shall be delighted to give them to you. You are a man and you have the right to live, but as you wish to live under special conditions and leave the ranks, it is more than probable that you will suffer for it in your daily relations with other citizens. You will be looked upon as a ghost of bourgeois society, unless some friends of yours, discovering you to be a talent, kindly free you from all moral obligation towards society by doing necessary work for you. And lastly, if it does not please you, go and look for other conditions elsewhere in the wide world, or else seek adherence and organize with them on novel principles we prefer our own. Unquote. I'm just going to pause it there for a second. Uh, so this kind of turns everything on its head. In, instead of society being a pyramid shape, uh, the, the one that, that Kropotkin is, is talking about enacting is, is more of an inverted triangle where the, the masses are basically all at, at about the same level because of you know fairness and democracy and, and these sorts of things. And these people that, that are wanting to rise above all that and, and, and still not, you know, do work, but, you know, basically, re as they say, be a ghost of the, the old bourgeoisie, they are the anomaly mm. and they're either shunned or, or, you know, hidden away from the rest of society by some, you know, sympathetic uh, comrades of theirs. Yeah, um, I, you know, I'm not even sure how much I can add to that last bit other mm -hmm. than saying that Kropotkin kind of confirmed what we were saying earlier about providing even the Shurgers enough food and shelter. Right. You know, if it's available, at least, yeah. he says here, because they're a human being mm -hmm. and they deserve to live. They shouldn't be treated like an animal. Right. But there was also the threat of some form of possible expulsion or shunning. Sure. You know, basically, he it sounds like he's saying, like, we won't let you die, but mm -hmm. we need you to help us. And right. if you won't, then bugger off somewhere else. But also, here's some food in a shelter. Right. I, I, <laughs> you that, know, that sounds like a really nice and humane sort of world that, that I would love to live in. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the, the only threat that, that those sorts of people, the, the old bourgeoisie, could really pose at that point, if things have been basically leveled off is if they try to amass enough power to you know reenact the old systems mm -hmm. and and but i mean for myself i i wouldn't want to kick out anyone unless they were coming to that point and unless they're threatening the the, the new system as a whole i can't really see a, a need to you know kick them out or, or punish them in any way you know just let, let them live and be yeah, a, sh be a yeah. shirker if they want to be a shirker. Like, you know, I, I yeah. don't really and just care. provide them with, you know, just they don't have to live lavish, but right. keep them alive, keep them safe. Yeah. You know, if they want more, they can help out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that 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 sounds like a much better and, and kinder system than than what we find ourselves in today. So, yeah, uh, for sure. Let's keep going. This is what could be done in a communal society in order to turn away sluggards if they become too numerous. Part 4 We very much doubt that we need fear this contingency in a society really based on the entire freedom of the individual. In fact, in spite of the premium of idleness offered by private ownership of capital, the really lazy man, unless he is ill, is comparatively rare. Among workmen, it is often said that the bourgeois are idlers. There are certainly enough of them, but they too are the exception. On the contrary, in every industrial enterprise, you are sure to find one or more bourgeois who work very hard. It is true that the majority of bourgeois profit by their privileged position to award themselves the least unpleasant tasks, and that they work under hygienic conditions of air, food, etc., which permit them to do their business without too much fatigue. But these are precisely the conditions which we claim for all workers, without exception. We may also say that if, 
Thanks to their privileged position, rich people often make absolutely useless or even harmful work in society. Nevertheless, the ministers, heads of departments, factory owners, traders, bankers, etc., subject themselves for a few hours a day to work which they find themselves more or less tiresome, all preferring their hours of leisure to this obligatory work. And if in nine cases out of ten, this... Go ahead. So I think that this part is has some important stuff in it, especially the last the last little bit. Um, the part where he talked about the bourgeois who works hard, but in hygienic conditions and in, mm -hmm. I think he said relative comfort. Yeah, this is often talked about by, you know, people on the left as being bad, like that bougie person didn't work or shouldn't be working in the air conditioning and at a clean desk in a white shirt that will never be stained by soot and coal, you know? Right. But to, it, it feels like that's a little wrong to me. I, it, I it's kind of one of those things where, um, all right. So, you know, the January 6th riot at the right. Capitol, right? Some leftist commentators were saying, you know, why aren't you beating those people in the Capitol? Like you did the black lives matter protesters. You hmm. should be attacking them. Right. But I, I just feel like they had that kind of inverted. Right. Like the right way to think about that or to talk about it, I guess, is to say like, hey, stop attacking Black Lives Matter protesters. I agree. Not to encourage some other group, you know, to be beaten. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think he addressed this at the end where he said that these conditions which – we kind of judge the bourgeois worker for are, are they're the very conditions that we should be wanting all workers to have. It's what we should be fighting for. And I just wanted to kind of touch on that, I guess. I, I think that's a, a, a great point. Uh, the idea of pulling everyone up rather than, than, than pulling people down who are at a, at a comfortable position. I think that's, yeah. And I, I think that's a very powerful way of looking at the, those capital riots as well is, you know, yeah, point out the differences in, in the treatment, but say, why isn't everyone treated this well? Obviously, you can do it. Like, they, they, they were so hands-off with even the, the ones that made it into, uh, I guess it was the Senate chambers. Um, yep. Just saying, I mean, they, act, they acted like they were a chaperone on a field trip, the, the police did. They were like, oh, all right, come on, guys. Oh, I can't have you doing that. Oh, you, you put that down. That doesn't belong <laughs> to you and stuff like this. It's like... right. I mean, you're right. On the one hand, you could, you could be mad that because if it was Black Lives Matter getting in there, they would have been shot before they even made it to the chamber. You could get mad that they, those people weren't shot. But you could also be like, why don't you just treat Black Lives Matter the way that you treated them? Like, no one needed to die, like, uh, for the most part. No one, no one made it to the point where they were, th were actually threatening the lives of, of any of the Congress people. They, they, some of them got close. And at that yep. point, that becomes a different conversation if, if that had, had changed. Uh, but the way, it, the way it played out, no one was in real big danger. I mean, the one guy stole the podium of Nancy Pelosi. You know, they, they wrote some messages and, on her desk. And, and um, I mean, people smeared feces and stuff like that, which was gross. But, like, it doesn't <laughs> oh, I, 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 I hadn't heard about that. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, there was apparently yeah and, I, and I do want to say that I... I I don't have like a prescriptive perfect line where sure. it sh like if we have police, how they should behave and, For sure. you know, but it, it, to me, it's just the messaging that we want to get across. Right. Right. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be attack more, it, more people. It shouldn't be make more workers do crappier jobs right. in more dangerous condition. It should be like the, the opposite of these things. We should be taking more workers from doing those dangerous, dirty unsafe jobs and trying to move them up right instead of demonizing being in a clean place you know yeah and 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 throwing if that our, makes sense oh that makes perfect sense and 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 throwing our massive research and development and, and technology budgets at doing away with the, these these worst of <laughs> jobs you know automating it in in one one capacity or another um absolutely i mean it if the the results of that where everyone is better off and and people are still provided for unless people have to die 
or, or just end up dying be, in the course of their work because it's they're doing less dangerous jobs. That's I can't see how that's not a win-win for society and everyone in it. Um, yeah. So yeah, that that that's definitely the way that we should be looking at things. Let's make everything better. Rather than let's oh how come these guys get it so good let's make it worse for them, I think that's right. a, that's a that's a good way to look, <laughs> to look at it, for sure. All right. Aha. Um, and I I see that uh, Ali Osher is in in the the chat tonight. Welcome, Ali. Um, if if you guys like leftist sort of content and you like political stuff, he's he's a I'm. Ooh, I'm, I'm assuming your pronouns are he, him. Please correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, but he is a, a, a phenomenal streamer, um, does stuff on current events, on, on all sorts of different political issues, a lot of stuff on disability rights, which I've found really engaging and important. Um, so, so go check out Ali Osher. Uh, click on the name there, and you can find find his, or I'll just say their channel. Cause I don't know. Very cool. Welcome, Ali Vo Belcher. Osher. Osher, yeah. All right. Osher. So moving right along work is fateful, right. they find it nonetheless tiring for that. But it is precisely because the middle class put forth a great energy, even in doing harm, knowingly or not, and defending their privileged position, that they have succeeded in defeating the landed nobility. I'm just going to pause for one second to, uh, to address the chat again. Um, so just to let you know, Alexandru, what we are reading tonight is The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. It is one of the, the foundational texts of uh, anarcho-communist thinking written about 130 years ago, something somewhere around that, like the, 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 the final years of the, the 1800s. Um, and we're, we're trying to relate it to the modern day and, and, and help people make sense of it. You know, these, these old texts can be difficult to get through, so we're, we're trying to do our part. So just to give you an idea of where we're at. Okay, we'll continue on then. And that they continue to rule the masses. If they were idlers, they would long since have ceased to exist and would have disappeared like the aristocrats. In a society that would expect only four or five hours a day of useful, pleasant, and hygienic work, they would perform their tasks perfectly, and they certainly would not put up with horrible conditions in which men toil nowadays without reforming them. If a Huxley spent only five hours in the sewers of London, rest assured that he would have found the means of making them as sanitary as his physiological laboratory. <laughs> that, that's a good line right there. Uh, yeah, if, if, if the bosses of, I, I wonder if the bosses of some of these corporations who perhaps have never done the work that, that they are getting paid for, don't really know anything about it. Well, I mean, whether it's mining or, or manufacture or just trading of one kind or another, I wonder what it would be like if they actually had to spend time in the conditions that they subject their, their, uh, let's just say hardest workers to you know, the ones that, that risk their lives the most, the ones that risk their health the most. Um, if, if everyone was subject to those same conditions or, or at least aware of them, uh, it would probably breed at least a little bit of empathy towards uh, the people that <laughs> are allowing you to survive. I would think. Yeah. Um, y you know, I think that, he was agreeing a little bit with what I was saying about the idea of talking about, you know, the idle bourgeois as, you know, not always being a great way to go about it. Sure. Right. And, uh, you know, maybe I'm a little harsh when I talk about that stuff, but it just seems like a rhetorical dead end and right. it's hard to win. Oh yeah. yeah. And you know, and I, I don't even think it's overly important really the, the idea that the rich are lazy and do nothing. Right. The arguments against billionaires are there even if they work incredibly hard. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, we shouldn't die on meaningless hills if we want to win. Oh, you know, a war of attrition favors the side with more soldiers, more fodder. True. And right now that's not us. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We need winnable fights. That's a very good point. And important to keep that. But, but <clears throat> yeah. And I also think that he's right that if like a Bezos or Musk had to work a factory floor. Mm hmm. They they change the tactics that right. they use, you know, to grind workers into bone meal. Right. You know, I, I think almost without question that they would. And, and you know, just as a, a kind of a, a humorous note here, I guess. Sure. Do you remember that old movie with Joe Pesci where he's a slumlord? 
Oh, oh yes. It, it, might, it might be called the Super Lord or I something like the, the super. super. Yes. Yeah, and like the judge forces him to live in one of his tenements. Yes. And uh, <laughs> and you know he lives there and he's refusing to fix it, but eventually he realizes how awful it is, so he fixes it. And I think that's kind of what you would what you would see if billionaires actually had to work in the grime. Yeah. Yep. And, and you know, and, you know, they, they'd be incentivized to actually make changes and, and make those positive changes that we were talking about. Lift everyone up rather than than say, well, you're yeah. going to be you're just going to feel like what it's like to be one of us and, and you're going to hate it and we're going to relish you hating it. it, it no, yeah. It's, yeah. They yeah, it's, they it's, definitely wouldn't make the the cubicles filthier. Right. If they were working on the factory floor, getting dirty and doing a dangerous job, they wouldn't punish people who worked in the cubicles in the clean office. Right. They'd, they'd, they'd bring up the people that they were working next to. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think that, that could be a powerful tool. And there, there's, um, there's a tradition among uh, some worker-owned cooperatives of, of trying to rotate around jobs, not only so that everyone can do yep. anything, so that if there's ever a problem, anyone can swoop in, but, but also for that same sort of empathy building uh, uh, end where, where people know exactly what it's like to do everything and, and they're going to be considerate because, you know, it, it, it's important to point out too, that, that even in say a worker owned cooperative uh, there's still going to be managers, people in, in support positions that aren't directly the workers. Um, I, they, they were traditionally called non-productive labor, but that, that, that seems a bit, <coughs> overly derogative because they're still essential to, to the running of a business. You still have to have people make schedules and do payroll and all these sorts of things. Um, so it, it's important for those people though, to, to know the effects of, of the decisions that they make. Um, even, even though that, that things are being, you know, uh, the, the big decisions are still ostensibly being made, uh, democratically. So, yeah. Very good. Yep. Um, uh, just to, to address chat one one second here, it's a, someone is saying that there is a twenty to thirty second delay in the the chat. Uh, that's probably just a function. You're, you're probably watching on mobile. I'm assuming if you're on your mobile device, there there tends to be a, a long delay in the chat between the, the the feed that you're getting and and the the chat messages that are coming up. So so just so you know, um, that's probably nothing that that I can do anything about. Um, if you want to move to a, a, a laptop or a desktop computer that that'll probably stop that delay. So just so you know, uh, anyway, let's, let's continue on here. As to the laziness of the great majority of workers, only Philistine economists and philanthropists say such nonsense. If you ask an intelligent manufacturer, he will tell you that if workmen only put it into their heads to be lazy, all factories would have to be closed for no measure of severity. No system of spying would be of any use. You should have seen the terror caused in 1887 among British employers when a few agitators started preaching the, quote, go canny theory, go quote, canny, there it is. for bad pay, bad work, <laughs> quote, take it easy, do not overwork yourselves and waste all you can, quote, they demoralize the worker, they want to kill industry, unquote, cried those who formerly inveighed against the morality of the worker and the bad quality of his work. But if the worker were what he is represented to be, namely, the idler whom you have to continually threaten with dismissal from the workshop, what would the word demoralization signify? So when we speak of possible idleness, we must we well understand there? that it is... Go ahead. <clears throat> so I think this, again, it, it points to the narrative that underpaid workers are lazy. Right. And I, and I think that, once again, it's backwards. Like I was saying about the BLM and the Capitol protester thing, it's all inverted. Right. And, you know, the, co the cause and effect isn't being understood when people talk like this. And I should say that the, I think that the bosses, they understand that what they're saying is total bullcrap. Right. But the people who hear it don't. Mm -hmm. So when the boss when the bosses say about their workers, you know, using the go canny, uh, password or, uh, <laughs> right. code word, 
that they want to destroy their industry. This isn't really true. Right. Right. They just want fair pay. Mm hmm. And I think that the reality is that the bosses who make that destroying our industry claim are the ones wanting to destroy their workers will and ability to resist them. Absolutely. Right. They want to break the working man so that they will slave for pennies. Right. I mean, they'd prefer that that guy slave for free. And they would do that if we let them. Yeah. I and mean, that's it. <laughs> yeah. They, I mean, they, they, they would literally be OK if if people were, were slaves, many of them, I'm sure. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, we have interns. Right. <laughs> that that is a really good point. Billion dollar firms. Oh, billion yes. dollar firms. Unpaid get college kids to work there for a, a year sometimes with right. no pay. With no pay. And not just like no pay. Like I don't make that much money, but like zero pay. Unpaid internships. And not just a couple hours a day to get experience either. Like these oh, guys yeah. are driven oh, yes. like 60, 80 hours a week. Yeah. Th there's, there's a fantastic uh, Adam ruins everything episode on, I think it's just on work and the myths around work. And he goes into just the, the, the rampant abuse of the internship system because how it's supposed to be legally is that if you are an intern, you were supposed to be there to learn. It's supposed to be like a classroom. So you say yep. shadow a boss. You, yep. you, you figure out how to do the, the tricks of the trade and all this sort of thing. You're not a worker. You're not supposed to do the productive work uh, or the managerial work of that company. And yet that's how it's almost 100% used. Like, like I've had a couple internships through uh, my, my college schooling, and, and that's exactly how it was. I was, I was always uh, forced to do the, the, the task that no one else wanted to do in, in a lot of cases. Um, yep. So... Oh, yeah. And and I also think with interns before we move on, I, I think that we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the class dynamics of that. You know, like when you think about the people, the, the kids, the college kids who mm. are capable of going through four years of college yes. and getting that debt or yes. not getting it and being able to work for a year, usually in giant cities like New York or Los Angeles where it costs so much just to survive. Oh yeah. If they're able to do that, then that that means that they're not poor. Right. They have a right. stability. Right. It's, it's just another system. yeah, it's just another feedback loop where wealthy people uh-huh can get their kids into the wealthy circle and absolutely. it prevents poor people from getting there. It slams the door right in their face. That's that's absolutely true. Yeah, and especially cities like New York where I I heard a statistic recently that in order to afford just your average apartment it, it takes an eighty thousand dollar a year job like that's that's money that i've never seen myself yeah uh, and it's hard to imagine your your average mcdonald's worker or or you know retail clerk pulling in that kind of money you know, who, who lives in new york i should say new york city proper um so yeah so the idea that that these kids can live in these sorts of cities and forego $80,000 a year because they work so hard as well that they're, they're, there's no time for other jobs. That means right. that they have to have $80,000 of support coming in from somebody else, yep. uh, some rich family member, some endowment, some, something. Someone is paying for them to be there. So Yeah, yeah, somebody is. Incredible. Uh, and thanks for the follow, Alex Andrew. I really appreciate that. I hope you like what you're seeing and, and hope to see you uh in, in this and future streams. So thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, let's, let's uh, keep on going here in the book. It's a question of a small minority in society. And before legislating for that minority, would it not be wise to study its origin? Whoever observes with an intelligent eye sees well enough that the child reputed lazy at school is often the one which does not understand what he is badly taught. Very often, too, it is suffering from cerebral anemia caused by poverty and an anti-hygienic education. A boy who is lazy at Greek or Latin would work admirably were he taught in science, especially if taught by the medium of manual labor. A girl reputed not at mathematics becomes the first mathematician of her class if she by chance meets someone who can explain to her the elements of arithmetic she did not understand, and a workman lazy in the workshop, cultivates his garden at dawn, 
while gazing at the rising sun, and will be at work again at nightfall, when all nature goes to rest. Somebody said here? that dirt. Dur- Go ahead. Sorry, if you think I'm asking to pause too much, you can tell me no, not to no, if you want. This, this really <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so when I hear that last part, I'm just like, yes. It's such a huge thing right there. And I love it. And I think he was very concise. Right. Um, I feel like you could write like a 20-page booklet just based off of that last minute and a half. Right. Um, and it kind of goes to the whole freedom thing, the freedom to pursue. Right. The, the freedom to follow your bliss, Absolutely. like Joseph Campbell used to say. And I have a short, a quick story here that it can maybe put this in, into sort of like a modern context. And I was listening to a podcast and I don't remember the name of it, but they were talking to a CEO of a worker owned co-op tech company. Yeah. All right. OK. And uh, it was based in Boston. And so everybody there who worked there was part owner. Uh, So and there was a guy there who wasn't being very productive and everybody knew it. The other owner workers noticed. So they they were trying to prod him along and it didn't work. They're trying to do the shunning stuff. So they had a meeting with like the board. I think it was seven guys in this person or seven people in this guy. And they basically said, like, hey, you're not pulling your weight. What's going on? Mm -hmm. We got to figure this out or maybe buy you out and let you find somewhere else to work. And it turned out that he really just hated doing the part of the business he was working in. Uh And but he had a passion for hardware. I think he was working somewhere in the software side of things. He just loved working with the physical apparatus and hated the data entry or whatever. Mm -hmm. So. It turned out that one of the board members knew that another worker owner who was working in the server room in like, you know, the hardware area, Mm -hmm. he wanted to work in the office. So they switched the two workers and everybody was happy. And at the time of this podcast, I think it had been two years Mm -hmm. since all that happened and everything was happy. Everybody was happy. Everybody was doing good. That's awesome. And, and, yeah, and that sort of solution doesn't always work in a more hierarchical s- sort of business, Absolutely right? They not. often just fire the the supposedly lazy guy, and they leave the unhappy person right. in the server room. And by doing that, that's two people that have been harmed. Absolutely. Right? So the supposedly lazy worker who goes home and spend hours on end working on cars or making podcasts and live streaming even, you know, they might... They might just need a small change of scenery or responsibility rather than a firing and a kicking into the streets. For sure. You know? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right that it, it oftentimes doesn't work out with the, the strict hierarchical system because, for one thing, all, all the best positions are, are reserved for people that are already there and, and you know, reaping the benefits from uh, the work of others. So that, and, and oftentimes they're friends or or former classmates or um even family members who through no virtue of them being able to work better just just get those positions so there's just not to begin with there's not that much ability to shuffle people around if they're unhappy where they're at and then also i i mean they just don't care a lot of the time um you know it's it's as long as the hiring market is is good it's 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 no skin off their back if they just let someone go and, and, and reach back into that, that pool and, and pluck someone else who's, who's going to fit that job better. So, so I would say that even in, even had the situation gone differently and they had bought him out that, that particular worker in that, that worker owned cooperative, well, at least they'd have a little chunk of money that they could use then to, to find a position that they, they like a lot better. Um, it seems like a much more humane and, and caring system of, for the workers, uh, than the, the very top-down hierarchical one that we have. So very cool. Um, yeah, let's let's keep going on. Okay. ...is matter in the wrong place. The same definition applies to nine-tenths of those called lazy. They are people gone astray in a direction that does not answer to their temperament nor to their capacities. In reading the biography of great men, we are struck with a number of idlers among them. They were lazy as long as they had not found the right path and afterwards laborious to excess. Darwin, Stevenson, and many others belong to this category of idlers. 
Very often, the idler is but a man to whom it is repugnant to make all his life the eighteenth part of a pin, or the hundredth part of a watch, while he feels he has exuberant energy which he would like to expend elsewhere. Often, too, he is a rebel who cannot submit to being fixed all his life to a workbench in order to procure a thousand pleasures for his employer, while knowing himself to be the far less stupid of the two, and knowing his only fault to be that of having been born in a hovel instead of coming into the world in a castle. Lastly, a good many idlers do not know the trade by which they are compelled to earn for their living, seeing the imperfect thing made by their own hands striving vainly to do better, and perceiving that they never will succeed on account of the bad habits of work already acquired, they begin to hate their trade, and not knowing any other, hate work in general. Thousands of workmen and artists who are failures suffer from this cause. On the other hand, and let, well, let's think about some of the stumbling blocks that, that are in the way in the current society for people to, to change their, their lot other than just the, the top-down uh, nature of, of business. Uh, there's things like education. It, it takes a significant um, amount of, of resources, both, both monetary and just time and, and effort, to retrain yourself if, if you want to get a different job, if, you, if, you know, if you're some sort of a laborer, but you'd rather be you know, um, a store manager at a department store or something like that. Um, I, I suppose that wouldn't be a great example, but you know, any think of any trade that, that you would have to, to retrain yourself for. Be a plumber. We'll say that. Um, okay. It would it would take money. It would take time. It takes a risk that that is all being borne by the individual. Um, what if we had a society that provided education for everyone, without putting them in in society's debt? You know, anyone who wants to to retrain at any time can just go to even even just a community college, even start there, and then and then to uh, you know build it up to to if they want to go to a state university or something like that. What if everyone's just able to do that, as, as long as they could meet the the require the academic requirements? How, I mean, how much more happiness would people have, especially not having the debt coming out of it? You know, that's no right. small thing either. Uh, I, I definitely experienced that debt a lot myself, um, having gone through. Uh, both an undergraduate and a master's degree in a field that I, I don't work in. Um, so yeah, it, it, it doesn't profit society to hold people back like this. Um, keep them toiling in jobs they hate, making them more and more resentful, as Kropotkin says, of work in general, because they hate their current job. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Sorry, you can go ahead. No, no, I you go. Cut you off. Gone. No problem. Uh, I yeah, I was just going to say that <coughs> that there is definitely a sense of futility sometimes. Yeah. You know, and, and when I was listening to that, the thing that popped into my head was in uh, Seinfeld, the mm. the mailman Newman. Newman, I think. yes. Yeah, there was an episode where Jerry is basically asking him why he why he's always miserable. And he was like, it's the mail, Jerry. It's the mail. It never <laughs> stops. You know, there's always more of it and, and so on. And I feel like that sometimes, too, with my job delivering oh, things. Yeah. Right. Like oh, every yeah. morning, there's just more of it all the time. Absolutely. Every single day. Yeah. You it's just relentless. It, you know, it's never any end. I, I, I felt that, too. I, I recently switched jobs. I'm, I'm now doing uh, I'm a landscaper now. Doing a, oh, good. The head good. of a gardening crew, which I which I'm liking a lot better. Uh, it's a company that I have worked before. I'm, I'm back again. So, um, but yeah, I, you know, before that, my, my last several jobs before that were all, um, logistics, all, all basically pack, package delivery and management of people that did package delivery. And yeah, I totally get that. The idea of it never ending, like you get to the end of the day, your truck is finally empty. You, you, you feel good about all the work you've done, but then you, you show up on work tomorrow and it could be even more than it was yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And the worst part, it's always the same stuff going to the same people, yes. you know, because we yes. go to corporate stuff. It's just right. Like, oh, my God, please just stop. Oh, it was the same for me. I remember uh, I, I, I used to work out of uh, uh, out in the kind of the, the country area of, of the Twin Cities. And there was one lady on a farm who literally would get, you know, five to 20 boxes from this company called Chewy. And it was all like cat and dog food oh, yep. delivery. 
every single day, every day. I, I knew when I saw that big load of, of chewy boxes that that's where it was going to go. I'd have to go onto that, that stinky old farm because they, it, <laughs> it looked like a hobby farm that they just didn't maintain very well. And they had yep. some dirty animals running all over the place. Um, so I knew I was going to have to go there. I was going to get barked at by the dogs. And it's just like <laughs> the same thing every yep. day. Yep. Never, never an end to it. Uh, let's see. So in the chat, Alexandru says, I definitely agree with sometimes needing a change of scenery. I have been working from home since March 2020, and I enjoy my job uh, so much more now than I did when I was in the office. Oh, well, that, that, that's good for you. That's, it's been the opposite experience for so, so many people. But that, that's great that you've adapted to yeah. having more right, Alex. And, and, and your, your own uh, space away from coworkers. Because, co yeah, I'm sure office jobs, coworkers can get obnoxious and overbearing or, or whatever. You have a boss breathing down your neck and stuff. So, yeah, good for you. That, that, that's great. But, yeah, you know, sometimes that's all that it takes to motivate someone. And maybe they don't even... Maybe they haven't taken the time or haven't had the energy to pause and think about what job they would like to do if they had their chances to do whatever they felt like. So, I, I mean, all it takes is, is giving people a little space and, and, and a cushion uh, in the form of providing their basic <coughs> needs to, to really give them that, that space and, and time to kind of suss out their own life and, and what they want to be. And for every job that, that, that someone really abhors, I'm sure there's someone that, that likes doing it. Um, I mean, you think of some of the dirtiest jobs, like, like being a, a trash collector. I'm sure there's a lot of people that, that enjoy that sort of work. Uh, they, they perform a vital service. And uh, if they were feeling more, if, if they literally were an owner, a part owner of that company, they'd probably feel even more satisfaction doing stuff that a lot of other people wouldn't want to do. But, you know, you think of anything, a sanitation worker, um, uh, a plumber, you know, any, any of the, the dirty or, or very dangerous jobs. There, there's people that would mm -hmm. want to do it if given the chance and given the ability to, to survive without having to worry. So. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. And you know, every once in a while there'll be some story on the news or wherever of, you know, just some guy who cleans toilets or something. Right. And they'll be like, Look at this guy. Look how clean those toilets are. And he's like, yeah, I just love my job. You yeah. know, I come in every day. I do what I can. I do it the best I can. Uh -huh. I'm happy. I, I go home happy. And, you know, cleaning toilets might not be that guy's dream job, but he tackles it, right? He makes it his own, yeah. Yeah. And just how much more would he tackle that job if he was making, if he was part owner of that cleaning business? Absolutely. Right. I 100% agree with that. All right, got some more people in the chat now to say hello to. Hi, all so, right. Banana Raptor, Banana Raptor God. That's a that's one heck of a name. <laughs> hello all. Well, hello to you tonight. Uh, we're we're if you're just joining us, which I assume you are, uh, we're talking about uh, Peter Kropotkin's The Conquest of Bread, which is one of the foundational texts of anarcho-communism. He's he's kind of laying out his his ideal society, and we're commenting on it. Um, and then Alexander says, "My uncle loves being a plumber." And then you're laughing about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. But sure, there's people that love any sort of job. Like, yeah. Um, I, when I worked in food service, it paid like crap, but I loved the work. Same thing with when I did Uber and Lyft for a while. I loved that work. I love getting to, to meet people all the time, going exotic places. I, I did a lot of airport runs. So I get to meet all kinds of people going all kinds of places and coming back from places um, and just getting a little bit of their, their life story and, and, and you know, I always had a, an interesting playlist of music or podcasts to play in the car, and, and I got a lot of good compliments on that. I love that sort of thing. But uh, then the, the, the reality set in that I was making, once you take out for expenses, maybe $11, $12 an hour, including tips. Um, mm. I was putting 150,000 miles on my car every year, and, and that was all just money that I had to, to take the hit for. Um, it just was not a viable job. Had I had support, had I had someone else's car to use, had I been giving, had I been getting a, at least a livable wage, um, I probably would have stuck with it a lot longer. Had I been getting health insurance as well. I mean, that would be a, a big plus too. Um, yeah, it's just a shame that, that, that people are pushed out of jobs that they, they really love because they can't pay enough or because they don't have the right benefits. 
Uh, there's a lot of people that are really dependent on, on medical benefits. And it doesn't matter how great the position is or, or even how much it pays. If it doesn't have medical benefits, they're not able to take it. Uh, and that's just a shame. It's a shame that people, more people aren't doing jobs that they care about and would actually want to do because of the system. So. Mm. All right. Did you have any other thoughts on this before we move on? No, sir. All right. Let's keep going. Actually, uh, let, let's get one more comment in. Alexander again says uh, he likes it mostly because of the hours. He works for himself and only works from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. So he gets nice. to sleep late. Well, that, that's perfect. And that's another <laughs> thing. Schedule. I'm sure there's a yeah, lot of schedule. jobs that if people could set their own schedule, they would love doing, you know? Yep. Um, but... I mean, at, at the, the station that I worked for at, at my last job, they were only offering, uh, I think, between 15 and, and $17 an hour to start for this, this overnight crew of loaders. They, they had a, a separate group of people that would load all the trucks. Um, and those people worked really hard. It was, it, was, it was nonstop lifting for, you know, an eight-hour shift. But they were having trouble keeping up. Like, a, as I was leaving... I started to hear those 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 conservative complaints every once in a while, like oh, people don't want to work. They need to do away with this unemployment uh, so we can get our uh, yeah. you know boxes in a in a reasonable amount of time and get out of here. I'm like, well, do you think maybe it's because they're not paying enough? <laughs> like, has that just not yeah. crossed your mind that? Yeah. Oh, it, oh, they thought about it. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. I'm sure they <laughs> thought about it. They, they, they're just using that as an excuse, but. I would hear yep. it even from drivers and stuff like, oh, get those <laughs> get those loaders back to work. Like they're, you know, mm. being so lazy. So I, I think they had lost something like a third of their, their loaders um, in that particular station by the time that I had, had just left recently. And they weren't making any plans to, to make it any better <laughs> yep. to sweeten the deal. So I'm assuming they're kind of in the same position now. Uh, oh, getting a long comment here. Let's see, uh, Banana Raptor God. Do you know them that most? Do you, did you know that most tradesmen are ardent capitalists like myself? We all like choosing what companies we work for. Being a socialist commie, I don't get as many options. I'd rather choose uh, what companies I work for, even if I don't own it. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that part of it first. Um, that's that's a pretty big misconception that if you're in a a state of communism. Or, or in this case, we're talking about anarchy, uh, that you have no choice in your job. Um, let me back up even a little bit more and say that in capitalism, a lot of people don't really have much of a choice in what job they, they pick. They have to think about baseline survival first. So for all of the people that are, that are at the bottom right now, it's not as though they can just choose to, to, as we've been talking about, go get an education that costs a lot of money and time uh, or, or choose to take an internship that uh, takes them out of uh, a paid position for an entire year. They, they just don't have that support from other family members. Um, so there's not all that much choice for uh, a great many people, for one. And for another, there's, as, as I, I'm assuming you're coming in late here, but as we were just hearing in this audio book, Kropotkin was talking about these, these, um, these uh, companies being set up. I... I I don't know what term he used, but com I will just use company for now. These, these worker-owned companies, uh, or cooperatives, for lack of a better word, are set up on a voluntary basis. There's, there's no central state. He's not talking about a centrally controlled state system where everyone's assigned a job. He's talking about a system where people voluntarily associate with others in trades that they are interested in. Um, something they're good at, something that they like doing, something that, that fills some sort of a need for them. And then these voluntary associations democratically controlling their workplace. So, I mean, you, you talk about uh, choice and freedom. How much choice do you really have in a current um, top-down sort of uh, authoritarian uh, uh, kind of autocratic system that we have now where the owner gets to call all the shots, gets to hire and fire. Uh, you don't really have a say much in your compensation. I mean, you can try and negotiate, but really it all depends on if there's someone behind you willing to do it for less. Uh, how much control, how much choice do you really have within that system as a worker um, if you're working under someone else's um, um, system? Uh, 
I would say not very much. I would say not very much. So what we're talking about is giving people more choice to voluntarily associate and to have a democratic say in their workplace. You know, that, that's not to say that every single decision would be made democratically, like day-to-day like -day operations and stuff like that, but, but things that really matter, like compensation, like, like benefits, like working conditions, working hours, um, you know, what to do with the, the, the excess profit as it's generated, how to divvy that up fairly, uh, all that sort of thing would be democratic and you would have much more say and much more choice in. So we're talking about more freedom and more choice in our system here. Okay, so let's see what else you have to say here. Um, mm -mm -mm, because I'm always uh, <laughs> changing until I find a top end company. Well, that, that's good for you. Not, not, not possible for everybody. Uh, once I find one, I will have partial ownership stock, et cetera, because I'm so valued. Well, yeah, we're talking about having ownership over the companies that you work in. Democratic say over the means of production that, that, that make you and all the other workers in your company uh, a living. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's that I, I totally agree with that sort of thing. I just want to have it be more democratic. Uh, tradesmen have lots of options, have 50 companies within 100 miles I can apply for. That's wonderful. Um, for one thing, not everyone can be a tradesman. Uh, people still need to do things like flip burgers. They, they still need to have all these, these uh, service jobs, these, these, these lower level jobs. They all need to be filled um, to, to give people food and housing and, and clean water and transportation, education, all these different things. They need to be filled by, by people. Um, so someone has to take those jobs. It may not be you. You may have more options, but someone has to. Uh, I think I'll just kind of leave it at that for now. And uh, I, I hope you, you stick around and, and kind of learn the sort of systems that we're talking about. I'll just say that. And we'll continue on with the book presently. And he who since his youth has learned to play the piano well, to handle the plans well, the chisel, the brush, or the file, so that he feels that what he does is beautiful, will never give up the piano, the chisel, or the file. He will find pleasure in his work, which does not tire him, as long as he is not overdriven. <clears throat> Under the one name, idleness. Do you mind stopping? A... Go ahead. Uh, and sorry to stop so soon, but no this problem. one strikes me as uh, like very true. That this is almost like, like a hobbyist or passion thing here, right? And sure. this is this is why people will work without threat of starvation or the lash. Mm -hmm. Right. Or at least part of the reason, I, you know, I know a bunch of people who work long, hard hours and then go home and create beautiful things. Absolutely. Right. They carve wood or use carpentry skills to make furniture or even small things like pens and stuff like that. They put up or they work. Yeah, or podcasts, yeah. yeah. Or <laughs> or they work leather or refurbish cars or write paint, you know, make pottery, stuff like that. And, sure. and nobody threatens them. Right, yeah. There's, right? There's there no is no threatening. strong hand with a whip mm -hmm. standing over them. They just work, if we, if we even want to call it that at that mm -hmm. point. You know, they do this labor for really nothing but their own enjoyment. Absolutely. They just enjoy it and love it. And they just want to craft something and nourish their soul. Right. To follow their bliss, like I said earlier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I just want to say, like, it, it's it's hard not being able to see the comments where I am. But oh, yeah. I, I think that there's a big argument between or maybe arguments the wrong way. But there's kind of a big difference between personal arguments and systemic change, like Absolutely. personal change and sy systemic change. And of course, any individual can strive and do good absolutely but not all of them can like by right. definition no matter how hard they work not every individual can be you know a ceo of a company because it just doesn't work you need workers right there's just not that many so we have to focus on systemic issues absolutely it's really important to always kind of try to keep that in our minds when we think about this stuff systemic versus personal and systemic is incredibly important absolutely yeah um uh, another analogy i like to use is if you play the lottery 
you could be the winner. You could win that, that Powerball or whatever. Could, um, yep. Anyone who enters has uh, about the same chance or, or more chances if they buy more tickets, but, but still about the same chance to, to win the lottery. But not everyone can win the lottery. That, that's, that's just a mathematical impossibility. Most of the numbers are not right. going to hit. And, and the same is true in the, the, the most utopian versions of capitalism. Some people can become uh, managers or owners. Uh, some people can have companies that, that they, they build up with their, their own two hands and, and work very hard at. But in order, as you say, in order for that to happen, not everyone can. Some people have to lose out. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I, I think we can do better. And, and, and this book is, is one version of how it could be better, where, where everyone would be able to um, would have a much better chance of, of reaching their potential. Um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy to that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll come up with something later. Yeah, okay. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, n- not everyone has to lose in, in this sort of a system. Uh, people can have more or less fulfilling lives and, and pursue their passions better than they, they otherwise could. And uh, I mean, to me, that sounds like a pretty good world and, and one worth, worth at least talking about. Uh, if not outright fighting for, um, so yeah, uh, sure. Uh, let, let's keep going on and, uh, see what else comes up. Series of results due to different causes have been grouped of which each one could be a source of good instead of being a source of evil to society. Like all questions concerning criminality and related to human faculties, facts have been collected having nothing in common with one another. They say laziness or crime without giving themselves the trouble to analyze their cause. They are in haste to punish them without inquiring if the punishment itself does not contain a premium on laziness or crime. This is why a free society, seeing the number of idlers increasing in its midst, would no doubt think of looking for the cause of laziness in order to suppress it before having recourse to punishment. When it is a case, as we have already mentioned, of simple bloodlessness, then, before stuffing a brain of a child with science, nourish his system so as to produce blood, strengthen him, and that he shall not waste his time, take him to the country or to the seaside, there, teach him in the open air, not in books, geometry, by measuring the distance to a spire, or the height of a tree, natural sciences, while picking flowers and fishing in the sea, physical science, while building the boat he will go fish in. But for mercy's sake, do not fill his brain with sentences and dead languages. Do not make an idler of him. Such a child has neither order nor regular habits. Nope, sorry. Let first the children no, okay. inculcate order among It's on the wrong tab. Go ahead. So this... It, it, it kind of reminded me of that little anecdote I shared about that tech company. Yeah. Right. They had an idler, a lazy worker, a laggard, whatever you you whatever word you want to use to describe him, I guess. Right. And rather than punishing him, they talked to him and they found the root cause. And once they had found that root cause that they tried to find a solution. Yes. Which in that case they did. And they actually improved the happiness and productivity of two separate people. Right. You know, two co-owners of that company which is just a beautiful result. Absolutely. Right? And I, and I love how he talks about not only finding a cause to address and to get them to not idle, but also talking about finding a way to get through to them via means that might be you know outside of the norm, like mm-hmm. where he was talking about taking the person to the seaside or actually building a boat with them to teach them the physical sciences. Yeah. Right? Or... or you know, a form of some sort of like practical education, I guess. I'm not sure exactly what to call it. And also the admonition to to not fill their head with boring nonsense, which <laughs> they find uninteresting, right. which would make them, you know, an idler as a result to right. to really enrich them. Right. Uh, yeah, that I mean, that brings to mind to me uh, our current education system, which primarily focuses unfortunately on just uh, the knowledge banking system or just stuffing as many facts and, and figures into the children's heads 
as possible so that they can, one, regurgitate them on tests and, and prove that the teachers are actually teaching and, and two, uh, make them good future workers. Uh, yeah. But imagine a different system where things could be more hands-on. You, you could, in, instead of knowledge banking, the number one goal would be instilling a love of learning or an ability to question things. Um, yep. Or just experimenting with stuff, you know, taking the yeah, time to experiment with different ideas. Yeah, I was going to say a love of exploration. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think I mentioned this in our, in our previous episode, but uh, I was lucky enough to have parents that, that tried to instill that in me. Uh, it was not something I really learned from school to, to love learning. It's something that was uh, just shown to me as, as something that can be rewarding in and of itself. And, and something that's, that doesn't stop as soon as you, you end school. Um, it's, it's a sad statistic, but the great majority of people, um, even people that go to college, once they're out of school, perhaps never read a book again. Uh, and, and, that, and that's not all their, their own, uh, I mean, probably, probably very, few, very little of that is their own failing. It's, it's the failing right. of the system to, to make that something that they would even want to do. It, it's it's uh, the failing of the system uh, of work, of the capitalist system, to give them the time and the motivation to do that sort of thing. Or the energy left over at the end of the day, if everything is spent at work. You know, uh, even, even jobs that are not physically demanding can be very emotionally draining. And oh, for sure. I would say that's the primary reason that, that these, these sorts of quote unquote trash TV shows are so popular is because it, it just gives you it, what it does is it gives your brain the chance to rest, to, to, to unwind, right. to unfurl, to not have to focus on problem solving or, or whatever it is that you're putting your brain to, to, to work to do during your day. So, it, again, it's not it, has, it says nothing about society itself. Or the, or the people that, that love these sorts of shows. I've, I've found comfort in, in these sorts of shows myself. Um, it says more about the system that, that grinds people down and, and doesn't leave them anything of their own. Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. Cool. Well, let's keep going. We're, we're getting pretty close to the end here. Um, almost there. Yeah, almost there. <laughs> Among themselves. And later on, the laboratory, the workshop, Work done in a limited space with many tools about will teach them method. But do not make them disorderly beings out of them by your school, whose only order is the symmetry of its benches, and which true image of the chaos in its teachings will never inspire anyone with the love of harmony, of consistency, and method in work. Do you not see that by your methods of teaching, framed by a ministry of 8 million scholars, who represent 8 million different capacities, you only impose a system good for his mediocrities, conceived by an average of mediocrities, your school becomes a university of laziness, as your prison is a university of crime. Make the school free, abolish your university grades, appeal to the volunteers of teaching, begin that way, instead of making laws against laziness, which only serve to increase it. Give right, can we workmen, pause one more time? Yeah, go ahead. I think that'll be the last one, <laughs> looking at no, the progress no problem, bar. No problem, no problem. But, you know, just speaking for myself, and this is sort of jumping off what you were talking about, um, about school mm -hmm. at our previous pause, like school, like really nearly broke me. It uh -huh. just turned my brain into mush oh, yeah. and it left me dispirited and angry and just really nihilistic at the end of it. And I I'm sure the way that American schooling is set up is great for some people, but not for me personally, right? Yeah. And looking back, there were so many ways that I'd, I'd have responded to various things way better if they were taught different. Absolutely. And, and one example I heard somebody talk about, and I, I don't remember who it was, but they talked about how people are taught Shakespeare. And I was forced to read three different plays in high school, I think. And I hated every minute of it. Um, 
but the speaker that I was listening to, he said how he felt like he'd have been way more interested if Shakespeare, in Shakespeare mm-hmm. if the, I guess, the course had be, had spent more time talking about why Shakespeare was so great uh-huh. and pointing out things like, like, hey, like, hey, these are the 10 phrases you know and use all the time mm-hmm. that Shakespeare wrote. Yeah. Or these are all the words that you use all the time that Shakespeare created or at least popularized. Right. And that's right. so much better than being forced to remember names and character yes. descriptions and plot points to pass a oh, test. Yes. Right. And, it, and it's way more engaging. Right. It personally. You know, which. It. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And in the context of what Kropotkin is saying here, it like, at least for me, it would almost certainly have led to like a fuller, like richer understanding of of Shakespeare, of language you know, in just of the probably of the plays themselves too, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That 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 I think that's that's exactly at the heart of it. Just this the idea of instilling wonder and and curiosity in people first. Yeah, and instilling foremost. wonder. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I try to do that with my own kids um, as as much as the the screens have gotten a hold of them. At, at least we tend to play games that are, are creative and that we can, uh, you know, do the same sorts of things that, that used to be filled by, by toys and, and other physical games. Um, but yeah, I just, I like, I, I love learning and, and I want other people to love learning as well. Um, and that the surest way to kill that in people is, is like you say, just to put a bunch of useless facts that have nothing to do with your, your daily life uh, yeah. into people's heads. Um, like, I don't, I don't remember. I, I know I've looked it up. I don't remember exactly what year this book was written. I have a general idea and, and that's really all that I need. It, it would not profit me one bit in my personal life. If I knew the exact, uh, day right. that, that, that Kropotkin <laughs> had, had finished the last, uh, letter on his manuscript and mailed it off and all this stuff. Yep. Um, but the but the ideas contained within them have, have been immeasurably important to to my development as as a leftist thinker, um, and as as someone who really wants to explore these ideas more. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think that's 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 a great way to to orient things towards towards wonder and and curiosity and and that sort of thing. And again, this these are societies that are possible. It wouldn't take that much of a difference. Um, wouldn't really take any more resources to do it that way. It would just take a difference in philosophy first and foremost, and, and a difference in societal values, what we value as a society, whether it's just, you know, productive workers or whether it's people that, that have fulfilling lives. And I think that's, that's, that's more than anything. What this drives towards is, is wanting people to have fulfilling lives that, that are, are, are free from the, the, the threat to the constant threat of, of, not making it in baseline survival. Yep. Yeah. Real freedom. Yeah. Real freedom. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're talking about messaging again, I think this is, this is something where the right cannot compete with us at all. Cause if you look at any of these things, whether it be work, uh, whether it be, um, fulfillment of, of, uh, the individuals, the highest ideals, uh, uh, contributing the most to their society and, and whatever that means to you, the left is the only one who's talking about actual freedom and, and actual liberation of, of the most people for the right. It's, it's for the few, uh, at the expense of the many. That's, that's what it always comes down to, whether it's the, yep. the, the benefits of, of the CEO and living their godlike lifestyles where, where nothing is off limits and, and, and anything they, they come up with in their head is something they can actualize, uh, at the expense of, of the workers who, just scraping by for the you know by and large um so yeah i think if we just hammer keep hammering on on freedom choice democracy these are all very popular societal concepts it's they're not hard to really understand you just have to tell people that hey maybe you're not getting that right now because they've been so conditioned in their lives to just accept the way things are and believe that they have freedom already yeah but I mean, these, the, I mean, obviously, if any of these ideas were put into practice, 
people would see that, that there would be more freedom for the average person and probably for themselves. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a much better way to, to orient ourselves as, as leftists in a, in a more positive, it, it, again, it goes back to what you were saying about just looking more at the positive aspects of what we're, we're talking about rather than just the negative, you know, how can we bring down those responsible? Right. Right. All right. Well, almost done. Right. Here. Let's, let's, let's finish this thing. Let's, let's finish it up. Who is compelled <laughs> to make a minute particle of some object who is stifled at his little tapping machine, which he ends by loathing, give him a chance of tilling the soil, felling trees in the forest, sailing the seas in the teeth of a storm, dashing through space on an engine, but do not make him an idler of him by forcing him all his life to attend to a small machine to plow the head of a screw or to drill the eye of a needle. Suppress the cause of idleness and you may take it for granted that a few individuals will really hate work, especially voluntary work, and that there will be no need to manufacture a code of laws on their account. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube. All right. This audio... Pro That's the, the next one coming up. <laughs> well, there you have it. There's the, the, the final wrap-up of, of Chapter 12, The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. Hey, we did it, man. We did it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean, for coming along on this, this <laughs> now multi-week journey <laughs> of getting through this chapter. Um, That's all right. Hey, life, life happens, life, man. Yeah, well, I mean, and capitalism gets in the way, <laughs> very literally. Um, so, yeah, I, I, for me, this has been probably my favorite chapter of the book so far. I, I really like the ideas presented here. I like the, the talking about the, you know, setting people up to, to live their highest and best lives while at the same time giving them leisure time and, and, and time to do with what they will. Um, I like the idea of democracy in the workplace, of, of not threatening people with starvation in, in as, as a way of motivating them. The, the idea that people will just naturally be motivated to, to do things if they feel empowered, if they, if they feel like what they're doing makes a difference. Um, and if they don't feel like they're doing it just for baseline survival, if they feel like they're actually contributing to the company or the, the cooperative that they work for. Uh, what, what are your big takeaways from this chapter, would you say? Uh, so I guess I would just start by saying that I really love this chapter. Yeah. Um, I, I think that Kropotkin really nailed what he wanted to say here, and it was really well argued. Um, I in you know, just kind of getting to the, the freedom thing that we were sort of ending with. Yes. Is like, if anybody's listening to this and they didn't hear the first part, like the first half of chapter 12 really kind of dug more into kind of the, I, I guess the battle between what we consider freedom a lot in our modern American um, culture versus what Kropotkin is really talking about as like real freedom, like real choice, mm -hmm. real ability to truly be free and move around jobs. Right. And I, and I, you know, I just think between that and like I, we had mentioned earlier, the differences between the personal change and systemic change are two really important things to focus on. And that, that's really what this chapter was about to me. Sure. And I really think it's important to read this chapter. It's really great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I've, I've very much enjoyed your insights that, that you've brought to it. I think it's been really good discussion, in my opinion. And I hope all of you uh, viewing on your various devices have, have felt the same way. And, and I hope to uh, see you all back for, for next week as well. Um, Do you have anything else you want to, to talk about before we move into the, the plugs and get out of here and stuff i not you know i guess i would just want to thank you for having me on your stream oh my to, pleasure. Dis to discuss the book in this chapter in particular i was super nervous when you asked because i'm so not surprising. a kropotkin scholar or well, or anarchism <laughs> nerd or anything but as i read the you know chapter 12 i kind of realized 
it was really right in my wheelhouse with what I cover on my own podcast. And it made me a lot more comfortable to talk about the stuff in it. Mm -hmm. And it was just a really a pleasure to be here. And again, I appreciate the invitation and you've truly been a wonderful host. Oh, thank you so much. That, that really means a lot. That means a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that surprises me every time you say that you're nervous to be on the podcast uh, <laughs> or on the stream because well, you do such a wonderful I've job never with done your anything own podcast. Live. And, <laughs> it's um, the live part that kills it's me. It's the live part, yeah. But, but we made it through. We, we did it. And, we did. And, and I hope you'll be uh, uh, willing to come back for perhaps future chapters of this book or if not this book, whatever we cover in, in uh, future streams. Yeah, I'll be here, man. Absolutely. All right. That, that's wonderful to hear. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you a chance to, to plug your work right now. I got your uh, podcast up on screen right now. So if you want to just give a little plug for what you do. All right. So I'm the host of the Tribunus Plebis podcast. Um, it's a show that covers current events, society and politics with a definite leftist lens and with a particular focus on labor and class. And if anybody's interested, just search Plebis, P-L-E-B-I-S, on whatever podcast service you use, and it'll come right up. Yeah, very good. I, I have uh, Pod News pulled up right now, which is an excellent resource. There's so okay. many different uh, podcasts, platforms yeah, know, out there. Yeah, there's so that, many. That uh, if you just go to, to Pod News, uh, I think it's a dot... It's a dot net, podnews.net, and you just search for your, your favorite podcast. You can find whatever streaming service you use. Um, so as you, as you can see, uh, Tribunus Plebis is on all the major ones, as well as a bunch of the, the more obscure ones. Um, and also a YouTube channel, which I forgot to mention. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you just started the YouTube channel, didn't you? Yeah, I Very did. Yep. That, that's awesome. You're starting to, to, to branch out into that. Have you, have you started the streaming yet? I know you were going to start up with that a little bit, too. I have not. It's still on deck. All right. Well, I look forward to, to seeing your streams in the future. Uh, you do have a, 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 a channel that you're going to be using, though, right, that people can find? I do. I believe it's Tribunus Plebis Podcast right now. All right. Well, on look, Twitch. Look yep. for that on Twitch then, too, so you can, uh, you can be the, the first people in to uh, see the new stream once it's up and running. All right. Well, I'm just going to thank you once more for your time tonight and in the previous uh, part of the chapter and uh, wish you a, a good night and a pleasant right. rest yeah. of your evening. You as well. Thanks again, Zach. All right. Take thank care. You. Thanks so much. Bye. All right. And that was Sean of the Tribunus Plebis podcast. Very cool show. Uh, I, I definitely recommend that 100%. Uh, right before, uh, I'm going to raid you into another channel shortly, but before that, I just want to give a, a short plug to my own content. If you go to linktr.ee slash bread underscore theory, you can find my link tree to all the different places where you can find my content. Uh, whether you're finding this on YouTube, or whether you're listening to the podcast, um, or whether you want to interact on Facebook, Twitter, I'm on all the different social media stuffs. Don't yet have a TikTok, but uh, maybe someday I'll be forced into that avenue as well. Um, and you can just see uh, the various projects that I'm up to. Uh, one that I'd like to highlight tonight is Left Signal Boost, the, the Facebook group, where we, we boost all sorts of leftist projects. So like if you do leftist media or if you're just a fan of leftist media of any kind, uh, Left Signal Boost is the place to come. And we, we post links and, and memes and all sorts of stuff. We, we, you know, we try not to take ourselves too seriously, but we also do serious stuff, including recently the, the page, Left Signal Boost TV, that is connected with Left Signal Boost, the group. I have been streaming. Uh, I'll just basically just take a, a playlist of leftist YouTubers and a bunch of their videos, line them all up, and stream them onto Facebook. Um, I've slowed down a little bit uh, recently with, with uh, starting my new job and having to take more time to do that. Uh, but if you go to the the Facebook page, Left Signal Boost TV, you can click like uh, and get update or, or get notifications on all the live streams. And it's just another way to expose you to different leftist creators. I do everything from the big guys like Lance of the Surfs and uh, Thought Slime, uh, even sometimes Vosh, to uh, little little known creators like um, Shark Thirty Zero, uh, Black uh, uh, Bread Pilled Black. 
um, and, and some of the other very smaller ones. I, I like to do a mix of stuff. So it's just a, it's just a way to expose you to different videos, different creators. Uh, and so I've been doing a stream usually about once a week now, getting down to about once a week. Um, so I, I, I hope you'll check that out as well. Other than that, I think we are good to go for tonight.